you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Father Mike Berry. I'm a priest of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary, a congregation that was founded in the 1800s. At present I am involved in the charismatic renewal in the Diocese of San Bernardino. I'm the director of the charismatic renewal. I'm also involved very much in Mary's Mercy Center. Mary's Mercy Center is an outreach to the poor and the homeless in the city of San Bernardino. And there we distribute food, we feed the hungry, we also have a home for unwed and unwed mothers and indigent women. Today I come to you to speak about prophecy. In the last program I spoke about the prophecy and the nature of the prophet. The prophet by his call, by his vocation, or by her call, because we also had prophetesses. They were called to explain the nature of God, to tell people about the nature of God, what constitutes God, what makes God up, what is God's message, all of those things. And we traced it from the beginning, the prophet as seer, to the prophet as intercessor, pointing out especially Ezekiel chapter 4. Ezekiel chapter 4 which speaks about the full role of the prophet intercessor. Today I'd like to treat just three things, the call of the prophet, the training of the prophet, and the need for the prophet. The need for the prophet, especially in our time, that we need prophets of all sorts in our time. But let us begin with the call of the prophet. Every prophet has to have a call he has to be or she has to be called by Almighty God. And many times the form of that call is another prophet calling this prophet to be a prophet. And when that happens, uh, usually the prophet will follow his master prophet or her master prophet and then in turn be trained as a prophet. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 and the call of Elisha the prophet by Elijah the prophet. And we read, here is 1 Kings 19:19. 19, 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat while he was plowing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed over him and threw his mantle on him. This is basically the call. He threw his mantle on him. He called him. And he said, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah two important elements here. Let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye. On first reading, we think that's just a farewell. He's taking leave of his father and mother. But in essence, he's not. What he's doing here is saying to Elijah, please give me more time. I need time to take care of my mother and father. I want to make sure they're all right. I want to take care of them until they die. And Elijah says to him, he said, go back again for what, I have, what have I done to you? You don't understand the call. And then Elisha does go back and he destroys the oxen, he sacrifices them and they eat and then he follows. In other words, there's no turning back now. He cannot go back. He doesn't have the oxen to plow the land anymore. He doesn't have the farm equipment anymore. All of that is gone. So once they hear the call, they follow. It's often amazed me, and I'm sure it has touched you too, that when Jesus came and called Peter and called James and John, we're told that they left their nets immediately and followed him. That's the power of the call. The call is definite. 
come, be a prophet, come, follow me. And Elisha follows Elijah. And when he follows Elijah, he then has to come into the training of the prophet. People today say, how do I know that I'm going to be a prophet? How do I know the calling of the prophet? We know the calling of the prophet in many ways. God will call us directly. God will call us in dreams, in visions, and we'll get confirmation of it. Many people sort of jump on the prophecy bandwagon immediately and say that they're prophets without hearing any call. It's a distinct call. We have Jeremiah being called. We have Isaiah being called. Jeremiah is called and he's told in Jeremiah chapter 1, he's called before his birth. Before he was even born, I've called you in your mother's womb. That's how distinct that call was to Jeremiah. And in that sense, the prophet is called. Today, prophets are called in dreams, in visions, and many times in a sense of being aware of the need to say something in prophecy, to call in prophecy. Now, the training of the prophet. How was a prophet trained? The prophet was trained very easily under the green tree. You remember Jesus spoke about the green tree on his way to Calvary. When Jesus was on his way to Calvary, the women came out and they wept for him. They wept and this, they, he said to them, Do not weep for me, but weep for yourself and for your children. And at that time, he also said, Because if they do this under the green tree, what will they do in the dry? The green tree was a sacred place. It was a place where people knew that they were safe. If someone was fleeing an enemy, he would go under the green tree because the green tree gave him safety, it gave him security. It was looked upon as a place where no one else would trespass. The green tree is very much like a banyan tree, a banyan tree that spreads its branches out and they go down and they form roots in turn. The prophet learned under the green tree. <coughs> <coughs> he learned how? With questions and answers. He would put questions to the master prophet and the master prophet would then answer him. So he was like in a school of prophets. There were many of them, but there was one master prophet who would teach them. In that sense, they got an understanding of the whole role of the prophet, what the prophet was supposed to say, how he was supposed to say it, how he was supposed to express it. So it was a school in which they learned, and they had safety there. Under the green tree was a safe place to be trained and to learn the art of prophecy. The second element in the training of a prophet is one that's much more difficult to comprehend, and it's one that many times our modern day prophets avoid. They shun it because it's the breaking of the prophet, the breaking of the prophet completely. In other words, being broken down to a sense of being emptied out. We're told in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus emptied himself. The Greek word kenosis, but for the prophet, he too or she too has to be emptied, has to be emptied of themselves. We read in Matthew chapter 11, verse 44, we read about that same type of brokenness. It says here in 11:44, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And that's basically what the prophet has to go through. We've heard it described in the classics like St. John of the Cross as the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul in which all that is of flesh, every vestige of ourselves is emptied out. And this is the most difficult part of the training of the prophet. It has to be God that's coming through. Many times I've heard people say, you know, in modern day prophecy, there's sort of 90% of the individual and 10% of God. So 10% of the message only gets through. But in this brokenness, the breaking of the prophet, the emptying of his own ambition, his own drive, his own sense of wanting to be important, his ego problems, all of these are emptied out. It's a brokenness that has to happen. A brokenness that has to happen. So what, what happens then he relies on Jesus. The prophet relies on Jesus. And we've heard this described 
in many, many cases. Prophets who come forward with a word, and many times it's their own word. It's their own word. They're trying to impress people. We have prophets who are frustrated preachers. They're preaching, and you hear it so often. They have so much to say, and yet the prophets, especially when they speak in God's word, when they speak God's word, when they're expressing God's thoughts, the nature of God, which is the true role of the prophet, very few words are used. Very few words are used because then the Lord is in charge. And this is the whole idea of the training, the brokenness, so that the prophet can begin to rely totally on God. We have that whole scene with Elijah in the book of Kings where he's challenging the prophets of Baal. And they have the sacrifice ready and they're waiting for their gods to consume it. And Elijah says, you know, shout louder, maybe God is asleep. And when it comes to Elijah's turn, he totally surrenders to God. He trusts in the Lord. He trusts in the Lord, and then the Lord uses the sacrifice. He burns the sacrifice for him. So in that sense, and when Elijah totally surrenders and trusts to God, and we've heard the expression in our own time, let go and let God. Let go and let God means we trust in God completely. And that was the whole idea of the breaking of the prophet. And for some, it took many years. For Paul himself, he's 11 years on the island of Tarsus. 11 years is a long time. For St. Teresa, we're told that she spent 18 years in a period of dryness or aridity in a desert. She had a desert experience. And what happens to the prophet? He may have the consolation of God, but there's a whole darkness that he goes through, a whole darkness whereby he has to rely on God. He no longer rely on himself or herself. Now, those are the two basic elements, and the most important one, obviously, is this brokenness, this emptying of the prophet. Now, we move on.